Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the 52 Must-See Movies and Why They Matter, based on the book that uh, maybe Dan has. How you doing, Dan? Dan Skippy Allen's with me. Hey, I'm doing great. Uh, this book right here is an amazing book. Uh, if you have not got this book yet, I definitely recommend it. Yes, yes. And... Um, it's it's got a Ford in there by Robert Osborne. It's the re, you know he he passed away uh, was it last year, and um, we are doing this for him. We're doing we're going through the book. We're talking about each film, giving a little bit of an analysis about each film. And today we are talking about maybe the oldest film I think on our list, one of the oldest, um, and that is 1927's Metropolis. Uh, it's directed by Fritz Lang, uh, which is he's one of my favorite like classic directors. He's He's done some really great films. M is a really great film, uh, film noir. Um, this one, of course, is is one of his top ones. Um, and, of, and, of course, before we get any further, like I just said a second ago, with me to talk about this movie is Mr. Dan Skip Allen. How you doing, Dan? Hey, I'm, I'm great. I'll tell you what. I love the silent era. And one of the just amazing, just groundbreaking films in the silent era is Metropolis what they went through to make this film. We'll talk a little bit about that. I mean, you talk about films like Apocalypse Now, what Francis Ford Coppola goes through. It's such a hard time. This guy had his hands full on this project. Yeah, this movie um, is more or less, you know, when, when we get into this movie, we're going to we're gonna spend a little bit less time talking about plot and more talking about its influence. And, and, and this plays into why we do these videos in general, which is, is why they are essential. And this might be one of the most influential films that we have in this whole list of, of movies in this whole book, because it's one on to influence bunches, a bunch of sci-fi films, whether it be 2001 space odyssey, star Wars, blade runner. It's really influenced not only with its themes, but with its aesthetics. And, you know, it's just, it's, it's, if, if anything, if you can, it's it, this is a long movie. This movie has went through many cuts. The original uh, cut of this film back in its original release was like two hours and 40, there's 153 minutes. And after that, you know, when they started re-releasing -re it out in theaters, they cut it down to two hours, then they cut it down to an hour and a half. And then over time, you kind of lost it. You lost the, the uh, complete cut. And then most recently... Uh, in 2010, they found uh, an almost complete cut of the movie um, and were able to, you know, restore it to the best of their ability. You watch it, and it's got some some parts in the movie that are obviously damaged parts of the film, um, but they do the best they can with it, and they make it a more comprehensible movie. Um, and, you know, if anything, there's a lot of respect to be given to this movie. If you can't, it's, it's, it, as Dan will call it, it is kind of a slow burn. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's hard to stay with it unless you have an appreciate, at least appreciation for it. And, and you have to, because this movie has just influenced so much and, um, getting in to, uh, some of the people and the characters, Dan, what are some of the actors and characters that we have in this film? Well, um, we have, uh, I'll tell you what, Based on this, this film is based on the novel by um, Thea von Harbon. And I'll tell you what, if she wrote a novel about something like this way back then, holy smokes, that's amazing that somebody could imagine this a hundred years ago or however long this novel came out. And, I mean, let's, and let's not forget that this movie takes place in 2026. So we're almost there. I know. That is so weird. That is so weird that we, you know, Back to the Future is what, last year or the year before? Like, I mean, that's so odd. Um, Alfred Abel plays Joe Frederson. Now, he's the guy. He's the main guy that runs Metropolis. Now, his son is played by Gustav Froelich, and his name is Freder. And these names aren't the most normal names, just so you know. This is a German film. So if you know if you didn't know this is a German film, um, Bridget Helm plays Maria, Rudolf Van Kleinrog plays Rotwang. Now he is the evil scientist in this. Rotwang is the evil, and we're going to talk about him because he is a 
that's a character that has been influenced many times over years in the years in the future as well. And of course, we have the Thin Man. Then we have Josephat, and then we have one one eight one one, and then we have Grot, played by Heinrich George. And then somebody I wanted to mention was Gottfried Hubert's does the music. Um, Gottfried Hubert's music. Oh my God, this music is phenomenal in this film. It really just brings the whole film to life. You know, if you didn't have the music, it'd be hard to kind of get through this film, like you said. But this just just like slams you in the face with this music. You know what I mean? Oh yeah, definitely. The the music is epic. It uh, really pushes the film forward, like you said. And uh, so, getting into to some of the plot, um, basically, you got this metropolis. You got this big city, um, and it's ran, like you said, by uh, Joan. Was it John or Joe? Joe. Joe. Joe Fredison. And um, he, you know, he's in the top tier. He's he's in this big tower. He just watches over a city. And at the bottom of the city, which they call the depths, you have all the workers that basically keep the city running. Um, and they are like the, you know, this film really goes into themes of the upper and lower class. You know, you got the lower class in the depths, actually keeping the, the blood flowing through the city, keeping the city going while the upper class sits in their ivory towers and just, does nothing, you know, <laughs> but, you know, but we have, uh, Frederson's son, Freder, um, who is also kind of, you know, is living the life. Um, and you know, is with a lot of women, he's chasing a girl around at the beginning of the film. And then he gets a first, his first glimpse at the lower class, uh, the people from the depths and it, it opens his eyes. You know, he, he doesn't realize how bad it is when, until he sees all these little children who are very poor, with Maria, who is like a social worker of sorts, you know, she's there to try to help, try to insp inspire them to keep going on. Um, and uh, that sparks his interest. Uh, what did you think about that scene, that first scene? I thought it was kind of funny that he was chasing that girl around and then he was just like, screw you, you know, and then he just leaves that girl and then just like, who is that? You know, that was kind of funny, I thought. Well, one thing I wanted to say that a, a something that, which I, I was glad that that they put this at the beginning of the film because I thought this is something that goes throughout the film and we, we eventually figure out why this is so important. But I just wanted to talk about uh, the mediator between the brain and the hands must be the heart. This is a theme throughout the film that when you watch it, you're like, wow, they this really does – means so much in the film as a whole by the end of the film. You know what I mean? And all these characters really have a critical role in this saying. You know what I mean? And that's why it's it, it, these characters are so important. There's not like – there's a lot of extras, but there's only about six or seven main characters. They all play a pivotal role in this film. And like you said, the dancing – I, I'll tell you what, you never, you don't usually see half-naked women in movies this old. But the, there was a woman in there, a couple of these dancing girls. The How about the clothes for the time? Oh, my God, was the fashion amazing on some of these women back in that dancing scene, that, that higher-class dancing? That was amazing. But, yeah, he saw Maria, and he was like, well, yep, she's for me. That's the girl I want. I'm going to get out of here with these hotty toddies. I'm going to go after this kind of slummy looking, poor looking girl, even though I'm a big shot, the boss's son, you know? <laughs> yeah. It was a good scene. Oh yeah. It's kind of funny. And then, you know, he goes and he talks to his father about it and um, tries to, you know, understand like why, like how can you let this happen? You know, while people are suffering and, you know, his dad just basically just, he's like, just, you don't understand. You don't understand. You know. You don't understand what it takes to do what we to live the life that we live. Blah blah blah. Um, so, you know, Freder decides he's going to take it upon himself, of course, to 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 get more into it. He wants to go down there and investigate it himself. And you get this very symbolic scene uh, where he he sees these workers, and they're almost like they're almost like gears in a machine. So, because this movie is also not only is it about the upper low class, but it's about industrialism um, and about technology and about how much we, and, and it's part of why it's so ahead of its time 
is it's it's talking about something we're still talking about today, which is our reliance on technology. And um and 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 the more we lean on it, the more we let it basically devour us. You know, like we're let it's going to eventually devour us if we don't have some control. Um, and you see these people and they're working in this factory and they're moving like gears. They're all moving the same way. Um, and then you see, he sees this big monster, um, that is projected, um, and that all the workers are going into it being fed like, uh, like, you know, a mon feeding the, this, the monster. And it's very symbolic. What did you think of that scene? I'll tell you what, those scenes, and, and I want to talk about, because the backgrounds are like um, paintings. And what they ended up doing, one of the tricks that Fritz Lang used was put mirrors up to show the paintings behind the people. So it looked like the people were smaller and the paintings were like these giant uh, like engine parts or factory looking things or the city as a whole. They really did a great job showing the the different the, the scope of what what how big of a machine was needed to run this city and they have the M machine and the heart machine and these are very important parts of the overall whole of the depths and these workers and it's like it's in a lot of ways it's like ants you know they all have their like their role and they all are programmed to do what they're supposed to do and they all have the things that they're doing and that was oh my god you know I, that was blown away. i was blown away by some of the lower depth scenes and the the factory and the and all that stuff that stuff really was like wow that's amazing to me yeah i mean it's the imagery is is just it's like i said ahead of its time fritz lang is one of these directors that i'm i'm slowly getting more and more into his filmography and he's just such a ahead of his time, you know, um, and he's, you know, you know, in a way he's fearless too, you know, a lot of this movie, uh, you know, and, and a why it got cut down through the years was because of its communist, uh, you know, implications, you know, a lot of communist implications throughout the film. That's why they cut it down so much, but, um, and the religious stuff, there's a lot of religious overtones, um, stuff like that. But, um, so moving on from that, we, we do going to our other characters, um, we do meet this scientist type. Um, what was his name again? Not Wang. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so apparently there's a history between him and um, Frederson, um, and they apparently Frederson's wife, who is now dead, her name is Hell. Um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 initially, um, this the scientist. Uh, was in love with her and then you know Federson stole her from him and got married and then she eventually died and he's never forgiving forgiven him for that from stealing her from him so now he is deciding to make this cyborg um, this thing to bring her back you know he wants to he wants to create this this robot to then and then bring her image back and have her back again and it's the 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 the, the design of this this robot is just awesome. Like, uh, and it very much, of course, influences Star Wars with C-3PO later. Um, you see, and, and also throughout pop culture, you see, you've seen it a lot in other, other things throughout history of them reusing that design in some way. But what did you think of that first look at the, that robot? I mean, she's gorgeous. She's absolutely gorgeous. And in the Avengers is a character by the name of Jocasta. Looks just like uh, hell. Looks just like jo hell. And she, she, Jocasta was supposed to be like a female love interest for Vision in the Avengers. So, um, but no, she looks beautiful. I mean, uh, if you watch all the, if you see all like the the posters and stuff, hell is like on almost all the posters. That's like a main theme throughout all the art and uh, whatnot, the uh, advertising uh, material for this movie. But I'll tell you what, I loved it. And Rotwang. God Almighty, do you have, do you see a resemblance in Bride of Frankenstein and uh, Victor Frankenstein or any? Of the, you know, are you kidding me or what? Oh yeah, he's definitely the influence to to your Frankenstein, your Doctor Frankenstein's. 
Um, also with the hand, he loses his hand and very much another Star Wars reference, you know, with Luke Skywalker losing his hand. You know, they kind of do and a lot of things. Star Wars is sci-fi moving forward, man, just really takes a lot from this movie. Um, and uh, yeah, so you get this kind of uh, look into, you know, that relationship and then they go down secretly to kind of get a look at the the depths without them knowing and he they witness Maria kind of giving this uh, inspirational speech to a lot of the workers um, telling them get you know kind of giving them faith you know um, keeping them you know going and um, then at that same time you you know uh, Frederson um, witnesses his son kind of starting to to get with the Maria character um, to have a moment. So he decides, he's like, look, I don't want them to be together. So you need to turn that hell into look like her so that, you know, he can keep an eye on him. So like, what, what is the deal with this guy? Like, why does like, he's crazy. <laughs> nobody can be happy except for him. You know, yeah. nobody can be happy. So let's turn the one girl that his son loves and can be happy with. Oh, let's turn her against him because he doesn't know what's good for him. So I'm going to teach him a lesson. And that's the end of the prelude. That's the prelude to the movie. That's the first, like, third of the movie. First, it's first a, act. Yeah, the first that, act. There was a lot going on in that first act that really leads to a lot of the second and third acts of the movie. And you get in, what I like is you do get introduced to all the main characters. You kind of figure out where the story's going. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, um, and 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 really, you know, this this at this point right here, it kind of gets us set up for uh, some crazy stuff moving forward. Uh, <laughs> this is where it starts to get weird a little bit. You know, he they they set up this plan to they they, they capture her, they capture Maria, um, and uh, they do this. You know, they put her in, which a lot of this stuff is just like. You're like it's 1927. How are they pulling off some of this like these effects that they're doing? These lightning effects and like these they're doing a lot of cool stuff. And and basically you see uh, he does like a scan of her and and is able to print that on the robot. And um, yeah, and then now you got basically an evil twin of uh, Maria running around, and she now inflicts her wickedness uh, because she's corrupt. Um, if you if you notice, you'll notice throughout the movie, you'll see this upside down kind of, uh, you know, star, which, you know, is like known for being, you know, when it's upside down, it's meant as a as a bad thing. When it's the right side up, it's a good thing. Um, but when it's upside down, it's it's it's, a you know, if you see like in throughout history, like cults will use this sign, um, you know, things, people that are into Satanism, stuff like that. Um but yeah, now the the wicked, uh, you know, I guess you could call her hell. You know, she's hell. You know, <laughs> um, goes around and starts kind of just making everybody corrupt and, and making everybody and turning everybody against each other and starting making things basically getting the whole making the lower class making the low the depth shut down. Nobody works anymore. Nobody's doing anything. What do you think of this character and what what this says about you know, the themes, you know, of like, you know, if you don't respect the lower class, the people that actually, you know, keep things running, eventually they're going to rise up and come against you. I mean, that's what he says to his father at the beginning. Well, yeah, I mean, it goes throughout history where you have companies that, um, you know, eventually get have their workers turn against them because they want better wages, better working conditions, countries where they – turn against their leaders, have coups and new leaders come in. So it's it's just right there with with history that we've seen throughout, you know, throughout the years. And it it's something that she really turns all those people that were basically drones and basically kind of happy to go about their jobs and go about their lives, go go in their lifts and go home and then the next crew take over and whatnot. Until she comes and messes with their heads and changes their minds. And it takes a lot to convince them otherwise. And it, 
And Frieder, Frieder has a lot of turmoil as for himself because he they're all trying to get him and put him in jail, put him cap, keep him captured, keep him so he doesn't say anything and doesn't get anybody out of the out of what they're involved in. So he's a capture of Rotwang and he has to find a way to escape because he's the old, he's our savior of the picture. So you know he can't be captured for very long. He's got to get away because we wouldn't have an ending of the movie otherwise. Yeah, and there's also this other thing that comes into play where um, the children are taken. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, it's one of them things where you like, I got caught up in doing something while I was watching it. But if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, was it the father that took the kids? No, the kids. Or did the kids? They were left behind when uh, Machine Man slash Maria, the con, that's what they call her, Machine Man slash Maria, she took all the parents because she was going to have have them riot and turn against Joe F Friederson. And they left all their children in their houses and their apartments. So once the place starts falling apart, guess there's nobody there to help the kids except for Freder. Freder and the yeah. real Maria. They're the only ones there. The place is flooding. It's being destroyed. And the only people there to help them is Frieder and Maria, and thank God they were there to help those kids because obviously the kids are the future, and that's another symbolism type of situation. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, and 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 basically you got a uh, you know kind of this this big epic kind of like ending where um, you know the lower class is starting to uh, revolt against uh, the the machine man. Uh, and they, 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 you know, they set her ablaze like a witch, you know, oh, they, 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 which is great, you know, and I have to say the actress, um, is fantastic. Uh, I think she does a great job playing both characters. Um, especially, especially the machine man, you know, she's very charismatic and very, you know, contorts her body a lot and does a lot of crazy facial things and just, she's really good. Um, and yeah, they set her ablaze like a witch. I thought that was great. It was a great scene. Bridget Helm, yeah, Bridget Helm. She plays both characters. In the Maria character, she's a wholesome, good-natured lady who tries to give people good, like Bible teachings and stuff. And then when she's <laughs> she's hell, she's freaking literally hell because she she's like wild. She, her eyes are all weird, and she like like does these kind of contortions and stuff. It's kind of funny the difference of the characters, but there really is a dichotomy between the two characters. They definitely represent two sides of a coin you know oh yeah definitely and uh so at the end as that's happening um maria is getting chased by uh, the scientist and uh so at this and, and, and they at the same time frida's you know realizing what's happening so he, he goes to find her and starts to fight off the scientist guy um and they have this big fight on the top of this like you know big building um fist fight and uh you know, it, yeah, it gets pretty dramatic in that scene. Uh, you know, he carries, uh, the scientist carries her up up to the top of the roof. She kind of falls and is hanging on for dear life. And they roll, uh, they, they're fighting, you know, and then he gets knocked off the roof and dies. <laughs> yeah. yeah that was, I love that. See, that would, yeah. and if you remember, if you ever see King Kong, very similar scene in King Kong yeah. um, to that. So, you know, that's going back to what we've already talked about. Films like Elysium, films like The Fifth Element, films like, you know, Blade Runner, like you said, even in the Batman, a couple of the Batman uh, entries, if you if you look at the the buildings and the and the and the stuff, the uh, structures in some of some of the Batman movies, they kind of look like some of the structures in Metropolis. But yeah, that was a great ending. And and you know, you know, we didn't talk a lot about Grot. Grot is the guy that runs the the heart machine. This is the machine that basically keeps Metropolis going. He, this guy is a big hulking guy, and he's if if it wasn't for him, Metropolis would have crumbled, and that's what happens. He gets taken away because of the mob, and then the city does literally start crumbling from below and flooding. All the pipes start breaking, and it starts flooding and stuff. But Grot plays a huge scene because. He he has to turn the the mob against 
Machine Man slash Maria and have him go after her instead of trying to come after Frieder because he said, no, no, it's not Frieder, it's Maria. Maria, the Machine Man, is the one that's doing this. We have to get her because she was lying to you. And so Grodd plays a big role in the film. And then in the very end, obviously, that that saying that I said at the beginning, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, it, it all comes back around at the end. The the heart, the head, the brain, and the and the hand, and the heart, you know. Um, and uh, that also plays into the fact that, you know, uh, the fact that this this robot doesn't have a heart. It just it just thinks and it does things. It just you know it doesn't have no purpose other than to just do things that are not good things. Apparently, you know, and, you know it has a very uh, bleak. Uh, outlook on on the technology moving forward um but um yeah i mean in conclusion i guess you know what are your final thoughts about why this is a definite like essential film and why it should be in this book why it was meant to be in this book well rotwing i want to bring up rotwing was the only one who uh joe Frederson thought he controlled hell but he didn't it was rotwing that controlled hell the entire time so Everything she was doing or it was doing was because of Rotwing. So that's why Hell could have been created, turned into a good robot. And she could have been doing good things. But Rotwing wanted her to do bad things, and that's why she was doing bad things. But um, no, the thing is, this film is such – I mean, it's a black and white silent film. But it has so many beautiful, like, scapes of, of these underneath – with the factory and how it it all comes together where the people are working and the machines are working. Then you show above ground and it's the beautiful cityscapes and whatnot. But it's also about, like you said, it's about countries. It's about businesses. It's about um, everybody coming together. The heart can only be there if it has the head and the hands. The head and the hands need the heart to to go so they need a mediator so everybody needs to work together and as a as a com as a country you know we're one country and we have people like china and russia and all these other countries we have to work together to make a better planet and a better world for ourselves because or we're going to destroy our own world whether it be with in the environment or with war or whatever like that and that's this, that's how far ahead this movie is uh, in its time. It was talking about themes. Yeah, obviously World War I was going on around then and eventually World War II. So it really had a lot of intelligent, and it's a German film, so maybe Fritz Lang foresaw what could, what was could happen with Germany in World War One and World War Two, and that's why he thought, well, this book is a perfect book for me to make into a movie because we really need some. We need people to see how important working together and being together as a whole, and not being enemies, and not trying to to be greedy, and not trying to be about me, 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 and be about everybody. And that's why this film is such an essential film because it's way beyond its years, Stephen. Oh, and, yeah. And it's a beautiful film. It's just a beautiful film to look at when you really think about it. Yeah, to think about when it was made. And, and of course, you, you know, putting it, keeping in mind the, the how hard it was to probably re restore this film being so old, um, over 100 years old, you know, almost 100, you know, no, it's almost 100 years old. We're getting there. Um, Ten years to go to be a hundred years old. Yeah, and um, yeah, it just it really does, and 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 just the 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 design, the production design, you know, a lot of not only you know paintings but sculptures, you know, a lot of a lot of, a lot of sculpting going on in this, and and just yeah, it's just almost in almost every aspect, it's got some kind of influence. So that's that's for me the definite essentialness of this movie is that you'll watch it and be like, oh yeah. I saw that in that movie. Oh wow, yeah, you know, like it's just it's it's nuts. And and and, and guys, 
do yourself a favor, watch Metropolis, get a history lesson here, you know, because this this is one of the movies that can really teach you a lot about um, where cinema, the birth of cinema, where it came from, where these ideas and these themes came from. But it, I think we, what's that? I, I got one more point. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock saw Metropolis and he used that mirror, um, that mirror trick to, to on 39 steps in another one of his other films because he was like, wow, cool. This is an interesting, I'm going to use it on a couple of my films. So there you go. One of the great directors of all time took from Fritz Lang that old mirror trick, making the escapes larger in the background, having the people look smaller with the with the escapes. So that that's that's just a, something for the very immediate future after the film came out. That wasn't very far far after that. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, definitely a movie that pushed the boundaries, like technically technical wise, definitely influenced a lot of you know it really you know. Uh, pushed what people can do in the film, you know, on the technical side, how they could accomplish certain things, because really this movie feels like it's a movie that shouldn't be getting made at this time. It's so high concept. Uh, it's so, such a big movie to be a silent film. Um, it's just, it's amazing that they got it done. Um, this movie actually was like super high budget for its time. It was like a $6 million movie. Uh, I think it's six million dollars actually. I, when I looked on IMDb. Okay, well I was reading. I was reading in the essential. Six million dollars when I estimated. Okay. Uh, and it didn't make any money. Like it made nothing. It made like twenty twenty six thousand dollars. It made nothing. Um, right. But um, it, it it's it's yeah. I mean Fritz Lang was known to be kind of a uh, a tyrant. Uh, he's one of them perfectionist type of directors and. Uh, he got some shit done. He got some stuff done that maybe might have not gotten done as early as it did if it wasn't for the, you know, his eth his work ethic to get to get to make some something nobody had ever seen. So, um, yeah, that's gonna be it. That's gonna be our conclusion of our talk on Metropolis. Um, anything else, Dan? Said yeah, like actually, you know, you said he was a tyrant. Fritz Lang was a tyrant. There is a famous um, story that went around that. He had, you know, we, we we have all the flooding and whatnot. Well, in the flooding, like, he was drenching these guys, like, all these extras for hours and hours and days on end to get this scene in the flooding seeds. And these guys were freezing, and they're in freaking knee-deep knee water. And that was some of the stuff that he did in this film to get some of these scenes that he wanted. And it that was, like, brutal. I mean, th for this day and age, if, if a director did something like that, I mean, it would have got out, and that guy would have been in all kinds of, no pun intended, deep water. Oh, yeah. Well, nowadays, you have to warm the water before you do scenes like that. They can't make them work in cold water because, um, yeah, you can get hypothermia. <laughs> but, yes, that's an example definitely of uh, – and you could get away with a lot back then. <laughs> you could get away with a lot. I mean, just yeah. just going in, going ahead to the, like the '60s with Mad Max, a uh, Road Warrior. They did a lot of crazy shit that they shouldn't have done in that movie, but they got away with it because that was the time, you know. But um, once again, we're going to conclude this episode. Uh, you can see all these other episodes we've done. We've done about I think about 26 or 27 other ones. We got we're heading towards 52. Um, and uh, you can find all that stuff on the Best Damn Movie Show channel. Uh, Dan, where can you be found? You can always find me at Dan Skip Allen on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. And, of course, on the Best Damn Movie Show channel where I host the Top 5 Weekly every week. And um, with these guys, Andrew and Steven, who have been really doing a great job with these episodes of the 52, they might have done a few more than me. Um, and I appreciate that. And but we got like like uh, Stephen said, we got a bunch more to come. And I got a new show coming up in October called uh, Under Further Review. It's going to be a sports movie uh, show where we talk about different sports movies each episode. And I'm looking forward to that coming in October. Awesome, awesome. And uh, you can find me on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Stardust. All the social medias, uh, Stephen Billings or Film Club Central. But that's going to be it for this episode of the 52 Must See Movies and Why They Matter. We will see you on the next one.